Welcome into the KSO show. Mason Voth, Drew Galloway here with you. It still cracks me up to see that Avery Johnson highlight and just think about how nutso that game was and how infuriating it has to be for Texas Tech. That I mean, think of how Will Howard has played since that game. He's been pretty darn good. He's looked a lot like 2022 Will Howard, and you would not have thought that he would have been at a point there where he wasn't playing in that game. K-State went away from him, and... Still, Avery Johnson just run, 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 run all over the place on Texas Tech. It that that will always be a game that makes me laugh. It's you know it's unfortunate that I don't dislike Texas Tech so much to where like I don't feel even better about it. It's like if that had been you know Texas or KU or somebody that it's just like there's a lot of vitriol for. Uh, it would have been even more enjoyable than it already was to witness that game. I'd throw a TCU into that mix. I really. I really turned off by TCU the last couple yeah, of years. I agree uh, with that. I just think that they've they've shot up pretty easily the dislikable scale in the Big 12. And once everybody leaves, they're probably going to be uh, the they're team that there. I feel like I have the most vitriol for uh, amongst the others. Although I, you know, Utah's come in a little snooty and snobby, so they might be uh, yeah. they might be up towards the top there. But they're at least good. You know, TCU is like. They popped off one year and now they're, they're cowering back into the corner. So I don't know what to make of them, but I'm, uh, I'm trying to not laugh my butt off here because I, I was literally going to open. And my first thing I was going to say to you was, doesn't that Texas Tech game feel so long ago? It does. <laughs> I mean, well, in, in all honesty, it was a long time ago. I mean, what was that? It's, it's close to like exactly a month ago that K-State was in Lubbock and that game was being played. Uh, we're recording this on on November fifteenth. That game in Lubbock was played on October fourteenth, so a month and a day uh, when that Texas Tech game happened. And it feels like the season is in a wildly different spot now than what it was at that point for K State. Unfortunately, the, there are some bad news on the front of K State being in a wildly different spot. They're really not in a wildly different spot because. Their chances of making it to the Big 12 title game have taken a significant hit given the newest update ruling change, whatever you want to call it. It's it's a clarification. Yeah, Uh, it's BS is what it is. The Big 12 had to clarify their poorly written, uh, yeah, clarify in, in quotations, their poorly written tiebreaker scenarios for the Big 12 championship game, which had originally stated that, hey, if, these teams don't all play each other and they are tied, then the the head to head is negated. And you can you can look through the rules and now look, what they have amended it and clarified or changed it to makes total sense. It it, it absolutely makes, makes total sense. Oklahoma State, if they beat K-State and Oklahoma in the regular season, which they did, they should absolutely be able, if those teams finish tied, they should absolutely be able to play ahead of them. They are more deserving. They won those games. That That is fine. But that's not what the rules said at the start of this season. It's not what the rules said two days ago when multiple people confirmed with the Big 12 that, hey, if this scenario plays out, it would be K-State that gets the tiebreaker. And now somewhere along the way, there's been enough of a stink made that the Big 12 said, oh, I don't know. We should probably look at this. And they've gone ahead and they've decided to, to make some changes to it. And uh, the way that it is worded now is that if the teams don't all play each other, but one team has achieved wins against all the teams that are tied, then they will get it. That's essentially the simple way of saying what it's been changed to as opposed to previously, K-State did not play Oklahoma. So if they all finish tied, even though Oklahoma State beat both Oklahoma and K-State, that would negate it. They would go to the next tiebreaker. And currently that would give K-State the edge or at least how we anticipate the rest of the season to play out over the next two weeks. That is no longer the case. That has changed at this point in time. And uh, K-State, they they aren't getting screwed over in the sense of being more deserving of it than Oklahoma State. You can make the case that they're equally deserving because there's one way to look at this, and it's that, yeah, Oklahoma State has those two wins over the teams that they are currently tied with, so they should deserve to be in. 
There's also a case to be made that K-State and Oklahoma, you know what they didn't do? They did not go out and lose to UCF and Iowa State. Now, K-State could still lose to Iowa State, technically, um, and Oklahoma did lose to Kansas, but they did not lose to those schools. K-State's two losses right now are to a, the team that's in first place above them by a field goal and by a touchdown to the team that is tied with them. Um, so you could make that argument, and that's totally fair, too. Um, but also it makes sense the other way to say, yeah, Oklahoma State deserves it. So that's not how K-State got screwed over here. But K-State and Oklahoma, they should have the right to be upset given the fact that the rule, it's not a clarification. That is bogus from the Big 12. That is for certain. It is gaslighting by the Big 12 is what that is. Yes. To, to keep saying it that it's a clarification. And to make it all worse, they send Brett McMurphy out to do – the job for him to explain this. This was the Brett McMurphy tweet. Big 12 tiebreaker regarding step one of multiple team ties and conference tiebreaker procedure. An event of multiple team tie, head-to-head wins take procedure. Uh, a precedence. If all the team tied teams are not common opponents, the tied teams that defeated each of the other tied teams earns championship berth. There have been no changes to any rules regarding Big 12 football tiebreaker procedures, which we were which were agreed upon prior to the season and went into effect August of 2023. Okay, that that would be fine if it was just a poorly worded explanation in the tiebreaker. I gave him too much credit saying that was the case earlier. It's not. If that was the case, you left a giant and meaningful chunk of an explanation out from your tiebreaker rules. And so you have added something to it. When you add to something, you're not clarifying. No. You are making a change. You are making something new. It is a new rule that the Big 12 has instituted on November 15th, whether they try to tell us they have or not. And like you said, you know, there's the gaslighting by the Big 12. Like, well, no, this is actually a clarification. We already agreed on all this in August of 2023. I would love to right now, without fear of punishment, be able to ask Gene Taylor and Joe Castiglione if they agreed to this in August of 2023. Or if the rules were written poorly and they skipped over a possible scenario and they now have two schools that are getting screwed over in K-State and Oklahoma in the sense of the rules are changing on them. And to add to it, Brett McMurphy doing the Lord's work here for the Big 12. Where did Brett McMurphy go to school, Drew? Oklahoma State, the school that will get the biggest advantage by this new rule. Hmm. Isn't that convenient? Hmm. Very convenient, I would say. Uh, Wild that... uh, he would volunteer to go on the crusade for uh, the Big 12 office here. So, meanwhile, the I... Big 12 still hasn't put out a statement or anything. Yeah. And on the and on, and on the actual like Big 12 show on ESPN Plus yesterday, they were talking about this exact scenario where Oklahoma State wouldn't go. Well, let me let me ask you big picture here, Drew. Is it time to impeach Brett Yormark as conference commissioner of the Big 12? I won't go that far, but God, like. Like you said, like Oklahoma State is probably the most deserving because they've beat K State and Oklahoma, but they weren't the most deserving by the rule that was in place literally 24 hours ago. So that that's where you kind of lose me on this. Where this can be tabled and move on to the like move it to the off season, like it sets a weird and kind of like a dark cloud kind of precedence that we can come in and clarify in quotations. Uh, rules with nine days left in the regular season like it this doesn't feel like something that should happen this close to the end of the season yes uh you are absolutely right there is no way that this should be happening at this point uh in this season and it's 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 kind of ridiculous the way that this has worked out and how everything has gone down uh but the big 12 is is making their changes here and now uh, we'll see how it ends up working out. So uh, that is that is that currently, and that's how things go in the Big 12 and K-State now a little bit more of a uh, long shot to get themselves to Arlington. They're now going to need Oklahoma State to lose somewhere along the way, which isn't totally out of the question, but as we discussed, now Oklahoma State already blew it against uh, one one of these teams. They finished the season with three games against three of the newcomers. They lost at UCF. They play at Houston this weekend. Houston is coming off of a loss at home to Cincinnati, so that doesn't breed a lot of com- confidence in you. Uh, and then they they host BYU next week uh, in the regular season finale. 
And I would be interested to know, going back and looking in these scenarios where they've happened, where when a team has had a chance to, since the Big 12 went away from north-south divisions, how many teams have had a chance to either clinch a share or win the Big 12 title at the end of the season and haven't done it or earn a berth to the Big 12 championship? Because you think about K-State since this happened, 2012, they finished off Texas at home. And 2022, they took care of business against Kansas and got themselves the Big 12 title. And it would just stand to reason that Oklahoma State playing a home game with a Big 12 championship berth on the line, it would just seem unlikely and improbable that they would lose at home to BYU. But I guess it's a, a, a possibility. And then I don't know how the tiebreaker would work out if uh, it's K-State and Oklahoma that are tied because Oklahoma also has a pretty – easy finishing stretch they play BYU this weekend in Provo it's an 11 a.m kick but 10 a.m uh for for all the locals in Provo and then they are at, at home on the Friday after Thanksgiving taking on TCU so um I think it's going to be interesting to see how things kind of finish off at this point in time yeah I'm kind of interested to see how uh everything will shake out I actually see a uh, a statement from a big 12 spokeswoman that uh Glenn Kinley of KSNT actually reached out and Kind of got a, uh, a a statement from them. Are, are you ready for this gaslighting again? Mm -hmm. uh, regarding step one of multiple team ties and conference tiebreaker procedure, in the event of a of a multiple team tie, head to head wins take precedence. If all the tied teams are not common opponents, the tied team that defeated each of the other tied teams earns the championship berth. There have been no changes to any rules regarding Big 12 tiebreaker procedures, which were agreed upon prior to the season. It went in effect August of 2023. You know what's strange so, about that is that's uh, that's wildly like to the point and very clearly defined, and that's something that the previous rules did not have. Look, I, again, I don't have a problem with the rules if this is truly what it had been in August and this is how you start a season. But if you are having to do this with two weeks left in the regular season, there is something nefarious going on here. And I don't think that the Big 12 is intentionally trying to screw K-State. I don't think they care who they're screwing over here. But they are trying to, in the middle of this, right a wrong that was a pretty big wrong that they had. Like, they had a pretty big omission and at one point this season, and they're they're kind of screwed right now. So uh, they're they're handling it poorly. You know, like, you just got to wear this. Yeah, the, the sentence literally said, if not every team, if not every tied team has played together, go to step two. You can't just pretend like that sentence just didn't exist. And no. that, that's what they keep trying to say. And I, that, that's the annoying part of all of this. Just admit that you made a mistake in the first place. Yeah. Uh, you, don't this, to, this, you don't need to gaslight everybody. This does, uh, you know, thinking about it, this does, I think, almost put K-State in a impossible situation to get to Arlington again because I think the tiebreaker after head-to-head -head would go to Oklahoma because they beat Texas, uh, and that's going to end up killing K-State. I think it would take uh, Texas losing, and then I think just a Texas loss to Iowa State I think would be fine. But now that – but who knows, because next week the rules could be changed again. Yeah, no, that's, that is uh, <laughs> that's is that's the <laughs> truth. Uh, yeah, it, it, it would take a Texas loss now, basically. All these schools went out and Texas loses. In that case, it does seem like K-State has a chance. But at this point, I don't know how we're going to calculate any of this with any certainty. Uh, so we're probably just going to have to wait till Saturday night when the Big 12 next week tells us who's playing in Arlington and who isn't. Um, my assumption will be that we're not talking about K-State playing in the Big 12 title game this year. And again, at the end of the day, that – I'm totally okay with that. I've been resigned to the fact since they lost in Stillwater that they weren't going to the Big 12 title game. And the way that things are set up, like they didn't take care of business in games they, they easily could have won. They they laid eggs at least early in the game against Texas too. And uh, they have nobody to blame but themselves for not getting to Arlington. I mean, they're going to do basically the same thing they did last year uh, and miss out on a trip to Arlington, if you think about it. Yeah. But, the the Big 12 is much weaker this year, and so there was less of a chance that the team at the top or the team that you were competing with to get there would drop another silly game. That's what that's how it happened to Texas last year, where Texas ended up in a position where they they easily could have done it, but they dropped that silly one to start Big 12 play at Texas Tech, 
And there really just isn't anybody in the Big 12 this year that's capable of doing that. If you look around and see how everything else went down. Uh, and then also Texas didn't have to play Oklahoma State this season. Um, that's that's a that's a big deal. Last year that was one of Texas's losses. So um, it's just K State's probably having a pretty similar season, and unfortunately, just scenario isn't going to work out in their favor. But the the part. part the part that probably sucks as like a Big Twelve supporter and all this is that this is all kind of leading up to. Uh, they do all this, then Oklahoma State loses again, and it doesn't matter, and it's going to be Texas versus Oklahoma. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that 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 is probably the scenario that it really opens up for, and especially with kind of how all this has gone down, that they do this to, like, preemptively make it so Oklahoma State would have gotten in either way, and then it's lining up for them to lose this weekend again to, and lose to Houston. Yeah, I mean, hey, that would be that would be great, and then you just got to get the the loss somewhere else and and see what happens. It's not totally out of the the realm of possibility, but uh, you are relying on Iowa State to get it done this weekend, which could happen. Night game, Ames, Jonathan Brooks not there for Quinn Ewers to to rely on anymore because uh, I think you know Quinn Ewers has been benefited by having some pretty impressive running backs to to pull with them. So we'll see what ends up happening. As for K State. All right, forget about the Big 12 title game hopes for however long. Worry about it if they actually get there. Focus on getting to 9-3 and three in the regular season, and more importantly, first, taking care of business against Kansas for the 15th straight time. K-State, KU set for the 6 o'clock kick this weekend. Uh, Drew, Chris Kleiman spoke to the media yesterday. It wasn't the most over-the-top, exciting, informative affair uh, compared to at least some that there have been. Uh, what was the biggest takeaway, though, from what came out of Chris Kleiman's mouth? Uh, probably the biggest takeaway, I would say, would be uh, Jake Clifton, a uh, linebacker that got hurt uh, last week against uh, Baylor. It took me a minute to figure out or to remember the schedule uh, that got hurt in the Baylor game on Saturday. Uh, he will miss the, rem the remainder of the season with an injury. Um. So kind of going into his place again will be Austin Romaine, who is a true freshman linebacker that has started at the mic for, I believe, four or five games and then uh, has been the first off the bench to replace uh, Clifton. Uh, another thing that I thought was interesting was it's not just going to be Bo Palmer uh, in this replacement of Jake Clifton, uh, that it will also be Rex Van Wy, which also means that Austin Moore will probably uh, bounce back and forth between the Mike and the Will backer uh, when uh, Romaine or Palmer needs a blow, which I, I think is interesting going forward because that means that Austin Moore will pro probably do most of the calls and the checks. Thinking about the, the way that the linebacker is moving now at this point, I th I thought Rex Van Wy, you know, we, probably the first we've gotten to really see of him in – um, extended action now that the, the the red shirt thing isn't in question. Uh, he'll get it regardless of how many games he plays the rest of the way. I thought he stood out quite a bit on Saturday when he was in there, and that's kind of the one of the first things you notice where, like Austin Romain early in the season, you're like, well, who is this guy making plays? And you realize, oh, yeah, that's that's Austin Romain. Well, that was kind of what Rex Van Wy was doing against Baylor. So I was, I was impressed. It helps that they, they can kind of just go – like uninhibited now with his usage because obviously you've lost two linebackers for the season at this point. And that's a, it's a tough thing to kind of swallow. Uh, in addition to losing to Jake, Jake Clifton, K-State will not be losing Khalid Duke for any additional time. There was some concern about that after uh, he tried taking on the, the, the Baylor player that threw the first punch and well, just sure? gave some extra. It wasn't taking on. He clearly won the fight. If, the, if there was if there was a winner, it was definitely Khalid Duke. That that's probably fair and uh, true. But uh, he will not miss any extended time, so he'll be a full go for the game against KU. Uh, that's that's just big to have him, and it would feel like a little bit of a gut punch if you lost another guy for a situation like that. Uh, and Chris Kleiman, I'm gonna guess that based off what they heard from Khalid Duke or what uh, they saw on video. They're probably like, yeah, hey, don't do that again. But Chris Kleiman didn't seem to be too upset at Khalid Duke for what took place. So I don't think it's a big deal. I think they're moved on and uh, he'll be available for the game against KU. Oh, yeah. Even after the game, uh, Chris Kleiman was pretty like calm when he was talking about it. 
And even how he answered the question uh, at the press conference yesterday, he was just like, yeah, he'll, he'll be good to go. And then just moved on. Like there was no talk about like, yeah, we told him like not to do it or anything. It's just like, yeah, he's, he's playing. Which I thought there was going to be a possibility that that did come up where he was like, yeah, and we're like, you know, he's got to be better than that or all that. No, just kind of moved on. So I guess that's uh, that's that's the way things are rolling at this point in time. Uh, one of the other things that Chris Kleiman talked a lot about yesterday uh, was the emphasis on this game was one of them, how the rivalry has kind of changed since he's been at K-State. And then obviously – he said, you know, even how different it is from when Lance Leipold took over in 2021 to where it is now. Um, but in terms of the actual game itself, he brought up that their preparation doesn't really change at all, depending on who plays quarterback for KU. They're so good offensively. They do so many different things, give you so many different looks that how you have to prepare for them. It doesn't matter if it's Daniels, Bean, Ballard, whatever quarterback you want to roll out there. Uh, what do you make of how K-State preps for this KU quarterback situation? I mean, I, I don't think that he's necessarily wrong um, because their their offense is so good and it's so run-based that it, it kind of doesn't necessarily matter who is in at quarterback because Daniel Hyshaw is a capable running back. Devin Neal's really, really good. And they do so many shifts and motions no matter what. The only thing that was a little bit different uh, from their offense and the little bit that we kind of saw uh, Saturday while we were uh, waiting on the K-State game to get going was that KU did run a little bit more wildcat than normal. And what was also interesting was that they would have that they had a few plays where either Daniel Heisch or, or Devin Neal would get the snap and actually fake it to Cole Ballard. So, I mean, it, it's kind of like it goes back to the, the preseason where everybody kind of talked about how one of the main reasons that Jalen Daniels probably shouldn't be, shouldn't have been preseason uh, big 12 offensive player of the year was because of how good Jason Bean was when he was in. And you could argue that Bean was probably the better quarterback last year. So, I mean, it, it is all kind of the system and that that's not like a slight at any of the KU quarterbacks. It's just that their system is so good that they don't have to change it that much. Yeah, and it's what makes them so dangerous and and so uh, I don't know, kind of uh, a pain in the butt to get ready for after K State. I mean, you think about last year with KU, we we said going into that game like, yeah, K State should be able to handle them, but that that is an offense now that you have to be legitimately worried about at what they can do, and it's the same type of thing this year, and they're doing it this season with, um, you know, I still don't think it's great, but an improved defense certainly. Uh, and I, this, this year's team is better than what last year's team was. I don't think there's much doubt about that. Um, but yeah, the, it certainly is a different ball game. Even if you're not preparing differently, um, if Cole Ballard goes, it's a totally different world on what you're facing at quarterback than Jason Bean or Jalen Daniels, uh, which it doesn't seem like Jalen Daniels will go because the, he wasn't even mentioned in any of the quarterback conversations this week except for the fact that he still shows up on the depth chart as an or, as a starter. So either KU's trying to pull off the con of the century, uh, or he, you know, who knows what's going on there. Uh, there's a lot of, like, Bill Snyder, how Lance Leipold is handling this situation, where there's so much stuff out there that even the KU football staff is changing what they say about the situation every single day. Just Jalen Daniels is probably the only quarterback that hasn't been mentioned this week verbally by anybody in this conversation so we'll see what it looks like uh but obviously that's going to be the the biggest thing that people are on the watch for uh when saturday night rolls around for k-state and ku uh anything else from k-state ku coming up this weekend that stands out to you that needs to be made note of i mean climbing to talk a little bit about the turnovers uh like in the last, like, I think he said five games, K-State's plus 10 in turnover margin. And, I mean, that's important this week. It's important every week, but it's important this week when you go on the road, going to be a pretty big crowd to take care of the ball and potentially force turnovers yourself. And especially with this KU defense, uh, they they are pretty opportunistic when they get turnovers. They I think they have three defensive touchdowns this year. So, I mean, it that's one thing that stands out, but it's more of a standout of just like it's an every week thing. But uh, Chris Klein did kind of go out of his way to make sure that everybody knew that they've been taking care of the ball. 
kind of enforcing turnovers because if you remember after the Oklahoma State game, one of the point one of the points where he said like we're not a very good team right now is because he said they were turning the ball over too much mm-hmm. and they weren't forcing any of their own. Yeah, and some people really did not like that it, Chris Clement almost made it seem like the bigger problem was that they weren't forcing any of them, which Look, I'll be honest, like, yeah, Will Howard was bad in that Oklahoma State game. Giving it away three times is inexcusable. But he was right in that moment that overall in the course of the the season, the bigger issue was that K-State was not forcing any turnovers. Like, that wasn't something they were doing. It didn't happen against Missouri. Uh, They got, what, they got one against UCF, like, later on in the second half when uh, Timmy McClain just kind of floated one up. Uh, and, they got two against, and they got two against Troy, and one was at the very end of the game. Yeah, so, like, it wasn't the most asinine thing for him to suggest. Just, you know, people have their preconceived thoughts about Will Howard, and we're ready to jump on him again and, and put all the blame on him. But it, he was right in that moment. And, look, I, I was just as frustrated as everybody else with how Will Howard performed in that game, but I felt the same way, where the defense – they did enough in that game against Oklahoma State to give the offense a chance. But to that point in the season, the defense had not done anything to help K-State win games. They had just done things to help K-State not lose games. And as we've kind of rolled on here, they've started to do things to help them win. And really, that kind of started in the game against Texas Tech, where they they obviously forced the three turnovers from Jake Strong in the second half that just flipped the game on its head. And then as they've moved forward since then, the defense has made legitimate stops. They've gotten the turnovers in the last couple of games. So now the defense is an actual element of this team that is giving you a chance to win games, just not lose them. And I think that's one benefit moving forward. I mean, if you think about the three losses that K-State has this season that took place earlier in the year, or the Texas one most recently, it has come down to, yeah, you've done enough things to where you could have won that game, but you didn't go out and win it. You just didn't you know, lose it. Like Missouri banged a 61-yard field goal on you. Um, that's, I mean, that's some pretty harsh luck. I don't know that many 61-yarders go in in a college game, but that one did. Um, so, you know, you maybe didn't deserve to lose that one, but you certainly didn't deserve to win it. And I think that's what I, I've seen maybe change now with the way K-State's playing is, they're putting themselves in better positions to go out and take a win as opposed to hoping you do enough things right and letting the win fall into your lap. And outside of the Texas game, uh, you could point out that one of the main reasons that KC lost was being minus on the turnover margin. Mm-hmm. Yep. Nope. They've, they've picked it up. They're being clean. They're looking good. And uh, it's a big deal against Kansas. I mean, it, it'll be in question of the week this week talking about who wins the the turnover battle and it's not just about who's plus minus is better turnover wise come Saturday night it's about when and where you make the turnovers or don't make the turnovers uh, because Kansas is as good as anybody in the country at capitalizing on major mistakes they lead the, the country in defensive touchdowns this season and the four that they've gotten this year have directly led to them winning three games I mean they beat BYU by what ended up being like 11 points or something. They scored two defensive touchdowns in the game. They got 14 free points in the game, a pick and a fumble return. They had a pick six against Oklahoma to start the game that earned them a ton of momentum. They had a pick six against Iowa State uh, two weeks ago that gave them a chance, and they ended up winning that game by a touchdown. So that is a big deal for K-State. Is There has to be an emphasis on – going out, taking care of the football, and not gifting Kansas, who is a very opportunistic defense, the chance to get one one leg up on you and then also get the crowd involved. Yeah, I mean, that 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 that's another point. Like, the the crowd will be a lot more into it with turnovers. So, I mean, it, it's just, it, it's an every week thing, but especially this week, you got to take care of the ball. Are you ready to experience the uh, loudest and fullest David Booth Memorial Stadium you've ever seen in your life this weekend? Uh, kind of. I'm. I'm. I'm excited. I'm. I, I don't really know what to expect going in. Uh, this is, I think, my fourth time uh, going to Lawrence, and I think this is going to be by far the the best crowd. So I'm. I'm really interested to see what it's like. Yeah, I. It will definitely be the best crowd for a K State KU game that there's that there's ever been. My first K State KU game uh, that I saw in person was 2011 in Lawrence. That was 59 21, kind of a, a blowout. I was also uh, there, so that that's kind of that's kind of funny. 
Yeah, uh, that was a that was a good time. I was there with my my cousin who was a let's see. He probably would have been a, a freshman at KU at the time, or freshman or sophomore. So uh, I I spent the weekend with him uh, and went to that game. That was a good good time for me at least. I don't know that he necessarily <laughs> enjoyed it. It it was it was good though because he had a bunch of buddies from his hometown that were there, and they I think two or three of them went to K State. So it wasn't like the the K State stuff was totally outnumbered but it was already pretty sparse crowds there so i've been to every road game in lawrence since then uh except for the 2015 game i missed the 2015 game because uh there was some bad winter weather and uh, i had the physical tickets in my possession and my parents were like no uh we're, we're not doing that because of the weather i was, I was a little upset but you know so right, we moved on tickets. what RIP physical tickets. That's yeah, that, well, I had actually, I had actually gotten them from uh, one of my my best friends. His family had season tickets to KU games, and so they were going to be out of town. And I was like, you know, I will take them. Uh, and so I had them, just never got to use them. And then uh, I did see one non K State KU game in Lawrence <laughs> uh, while I was in college. Um, Would have been the 2017 season. KU was on their bye week. And or K State was on their bye week, so KU was playing. I was like, well, let's you know, let's just go check them out. Uh, they played West Virginia, and it was it was not a close game. So, it, <laughs> although KU made a little bit of a charge uh, at one point, and it made you really start to think, like, could they do this? Uh, and they in fact could not do it, but they tried. They really did try. Uh, West Virginia got up thirty five to ten, and then at the end of the third quarter, KU had made it thirty five twenty seven. So, do you want to take a guess on uh, who the quarterback in that game was for West Virginia? Uh, was that uh, was that Will Greer? That was, was that Will him? Greer. Yes. Current. Uh, well, I don't think he's current anymore. I think he's been booted. But uh, at the start of the season, was a Dallas Cowboys quarterback, but uh, not anymore. Um, yeah, how about this stat line in the game? Khalil Herbert, two hundred ninety-one rushing yards and two touchdowns on thirty. And they carries. lost. And they lost. Yeah. I always forget that Cleo Herbert was at KU for a minute. Well, this has kind of been the KU thing where they've just decided that the best running back on their roster wasn't good enough for them, and then they have to move on. I It is the most baffling thing of all time why KU looked at him and was like, yeah, Khalil Herbert, get the hell out of here. We're, you know, we're moving on from you. Because he, uh, he, he made it all the way through four years there, and in 2019, uh, he decided that hey, I gotta, I gotta get out of here. I think he was, uh, me was it him that decided after like the West Virginia game that he was done? I think. I think so. Uh, and then they they moved on. He moved on, and you know they they had to keep riding Puka Williams or whoever it was. So yeah, Khalil Herbert, Kansas Jayhawk legend, uh, now a starting running back in the NFL when he's actually healthy. So good times. I. I love I love a good old fashioned old Big Twelve box score uh, and and can go through and everything else. So I, I will give everybody permission to quit listening right now. Uh, Drew, just name just name a year of K State KU since the streak began, and uh, I'm going to quiz you about uh, what happened in that game. Just random Ooh. things that, that pop up. So you you name your year. Some people are really going to love this, and like I said, other people. I gave you permission. To quit listening so we'll go we'll go 2016 oh perfect perfect uh said perfect. friend who gave me the 2015 tickets he came to the 2016 game with me uh well i think you know the big note about the 2016 game uh that was uh that was bill snyder's 200, 200 win yeah. yeah so all right so uh all right here's a good one how many passes did k-state throw in that game i'll go like 18 it had to be something crazy low if you're throwing this out there uh it was crazy low k-state threw only 11 passes in the 2016 game <laughs> jesse Ertz only threw six of them joe hubner threw four of them and alex delton threw one of them <laughs> uh alex barnes and jesse Ertz, they were both right around 100 yards barnes 103 Ertz 99 uh K State had one player with two touchdowns in the game. Do you know who that player was? Justin Silman. No, it was not oh. Justin Silman. Two carries in the game for Justin Silman. Uh, it's a very easy answer. Think about it. 2016 K State football. Who scored two touchdowns on 15 yards rushing? 
Oh, Winston Demel. Yes, that would be Winnie <laughs> finding the end zone uh, multiple times uh, in that game. Carter Justin, Stanley, shout out, 300 yards passing in that game. Justin Selman felt great coming out of the hand. No, I, I think I don't think it was a bad guess. I do think that there was uh, there's a chance of that. Also, so K State was six of eleven passing. Uh, only one receiver caught a pass in the game. It was Byron Pringle. He caught five balls for 77 yards, and Charles Jones had one catch for 22 yards. I I was at the game, and it you know K State won 34 19. It it got comfortable for a stretch there. But I don't even I don't even have a recollection of it being like that weird and bad and ugly. So you picked an awesome game to start this <laughs> off with. Yeah, I, I don't remember that game at all, besides it being uh Bill Snyder's two hundredth win. Yeah, that was uh that was my my freshman uh my freshman year at K State. So that was uh that was a, a, a grand old time. All right, na- name 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 another year here for me. We'll we'll go twenty ten. Oh yeah, I think that I think that this was like the, was this the Thursday night one? Yes, this was the Thursday night one. Man, I you know K State had beat him the year before, but this was game two of the streak uh, that's currently rolling, and I it was the most badass feeling going to school the next day on a Friday and just waltzing around after K State did that to KU, and since it was one of like only four college football games on Thursday night, just the the highlights were constantly being played on sports center uh let's dig into this uh do you know what the score was after the first quarter of the, that that of that game was this the one that was like 28 nothing at the end of the first quarter no complete opposite it was three nothing k-state oh and then it, oh it was yeah and then it got ugly yeah and then they scored 28 points in the second quarter they're up 31 nothing at halftime all right let's let's dive into this uh a little bit more see Ooh, Pretty sure okay. this was a Thursday night FSN game too. It was. It it absolutely was. I just remember at one point Dave Lappin uh, said something that, like David Garrett made a play, and Dave All Lappin right. was like, "That's my that's my man right there." I was like, oh, "Okay, whatever." Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Carson Kaufman had a QBR of ninety eight point one in the game, and do you want to take a guess of how many incompletions he threw? He threw sixteen passes. I'll say uh, two incompletions. Even less. He threw one. He was 15 of 16 in the game. Uh, K-State had three guys run for over 60 yards. Carson Kaufman also had 42. Daniel Thomas, 91. William Powell, 70 on five carries. Uh, Colin Klein, two carries, 60 yards. And then Kaufman had 42. Uh, Very young John Hubert had 19 rushing yards in the game. I think Klein, two for 60, is the most interesting uh fact about this game yeah uh aubrey quarles also had a carry in the game four yards so good for aubrey quarles i yeah. i was gonna look to see if he if he had done anything to, to throw him out there and mention him um i don't know if there's anything else too terribly interesting here two guys caught touchdown passes uh kind of unique for the the era that we started to move into uh where there's a giant lull but do you know who caught the two touchdown passes it's two different guys but they weren't wide receivers Two different guys and they weren't wide receivers. Okay. Uh, ooh. Okay. One of them has to be like another fullback tight end kind of going on. Is, is one of them a fullback? Uh, no, both are tight ends. Oh, God. And both of these guys felt like they were, they were playing at K-State for a long time because oh. they were oh, on it- good teams moving forward. It is one of them, uh, Andre McDonald. Yeah. Or, yep. Yeah. Andre McDonald, one catch, 29 yards, touchdown. Yeah. And then I'll say that the other one's like Travis Tannehill. Yeah, too. Tra- Travis Tannehill. There you go. So, yeah. <laughs> yep. That's really about all that I can I can pick out of this game. It was not like anything uh, too wild or crazy looking at this. Stephen Harrison had an interception, so he had that going for him. Um <laughs> I don't, I really, there's really not much. And on the KU side, there's nothing fascinating about what they did in that game. So uh, I'll have you throw out like uh, maybe a couple more years as, as we keep this going. Cause I am enjoying this looking through this stuff. You know, why not? Let's go 2018. Oh God. I love, <laughs> I, I love and hate the 2018 game at all at the same time. Uh, as a guy that was a big Alex Delton fan, uh, at least I played one on the radio with John Kurtz at the time. Uh, yeah. Uh, K-State, as everybody remembers, snuck that one out 21 to 17 
the final score in the game. Uh, I I don't even know what would have happened for this to have gone down. Uh, Colby Moore apparently threw a pass in the game for K-State. I don't remember that happening. No. Um, but I would love to know the scenario in which it happened. Um, I didn't go in for the second half of this game. Fun fact for oh, you. Wow. wow, you gave up on him. Yeah, I the 2018 season, I was not having a great time. Okay, uh, let's see here. What is the most notable thing? Uh, oh, not to be not to trying to be mean here, uh, but so some something went down in the game. Blake Lynch was three of three on extra points, but he didn't attempt a field goal. Do you know the kicker that missed a field goal for K State against KU in this game? K State had two kickers at this time. Uh, was it uh was this one Cantelli too? No, no, no. This was this was post Cantelli. Uh, ooh, you're. I don't think you're gonna remember it at all. I only remember him because I had like a class or two at K State with him, uh, and I and I was like, I'll never see you on the field. And then he <laughs> missed the kick in that game, and I just felt bad whenever I would look at him the rest of the time. Uh, so my apologies to Andrew Hicks, who oh my was, God. was sent into the game to kick a 53 yard field goal that he missed. I mean, that's Bill Snyder putting a guy out there just in a, a totally unwinnable yeah. situation if that's uh, not setting up your kicker for success at all haven't it, haven't kicked all year come in make make a 53 yarder for us which became a very common theme for bill snyder uh t- down the the end stretch of his career uh putting guys in positions that they had no business in being in and just letting people trash them uh but yeah that was that was andrew hicks in that game uh all right well the man of the hour was alex delton he <sighs> ran in the uh the the game winning score you can you can ballpark this, but do you know how much time was left in the game when Alex Delton scored the go-ahead touchdown? I'll say like three minutes. That's pretty spot on. 246 was left on the clock when Alex Delton did his weird little strut into the end zone that I'll never forget. I was his Heisman moment. It was his Heisman moment. Yeah. If Alex Delton was good enough to be a Heisman contender, that would have won him the Heisman right there. However, uh, he won a Heisman in my heart for uh, keeping the streak alive against KU. I mean, I was having, I I was in that end zone where he scored, uh, watching the game because you know it was late in the game, so whatever, getting ready to move on. And I can uh, I can remember just like going over the process in my head, like how do you respond to losing to KU in football? Like it's it it just feels so far out there and everything. Uh, I was going through that, and then he just busted through 21-yard run. I will be dead serious when I tell people. I think that's my favorite K-State play of all time. I really do. It's just – it that is up there with how much I love the 2007 NIT game against Vermont. Like, <laughs> not really is that my favorite game ever or, you know, Alex Delton's run. But, like, if somebody's like, hey, give me, like, a, a, a niche, like, moment that you really love, that Alex Delton run, boy – Nothing, nothing compares to what happened there. So, uh, I, I appreciate that game, but yeah. Uh, let's see anything else interesting from this game. Well, Alex Barn ran for, uh, over a hundred yards, two touchdowns. Um, nobody too crazy caught a pass that would blow your mind in that game. It just kind of shows what a bad situation K state's, uh, receiving room was at that point in time. So not much to to throw out there in that situation. So we can we can move on. Pick pick one more year here. Make it a good one. Uh we'll go we'll go 2016 as our final one. Uh well 2016 you are, you started the the segment with that. So maybe this oh, tells yeah. me we've gone on too long. Yeah, we'll we'll go 15 then. Okay, perfect. Uh I can already tell you that uh K-State had a uh I guess we would call it a special team score in this game i guess we'll call it a special team score (laughs) uh so looking through and seeing how all this uh goes um well it's not really all that fun because morgan burns recovered the 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 punt that was blocked in the end zone uh so it's you know a guy that already had enough touchdowns on special teams that year he just got another freebie uh k-state had three fullbacks or three touchdowns from fullbacks in this game. I'm sure you can guess uh, who one of them was. Uh, Winston Dimmel. Yeah, Winston Dimmel, uh, just the Jayhawk killer. (laughs) Just throttling guys there. 
Uh, he the first one was a twelve yard run by by Winnie. So props to him on that one. Ku turned it over on downs. This is this is very funny. So uh, here is here is how it played out. Uh, Ryan Willis complete pass to Keon Kenner for five yards. He completed another pass for three yards. So it's third and two at the Ku thirty one. Jordan Willis sacked him back to the twenty five, and Ku's punter had trouble with the snap. It would appear. And uh, he fell on the ball at the KU 12-yard line, and they gave it to Winston Dimmel, who ran in for a 12-yard touchdown. Uh, there was one other fullback that scored, though. And, uh, Glenn probably, Gronkowski. Yep, a fullback that people probably would have wished uh, that K-State used more. Uh, and then they did. And let's see if there's anything else notable. I mean, K-State didn't have what I would call a real player score a touchdown until the second quarter. Uh, Joe Hubner <laughs> Joe Hubner ran in a touchdown. Um, actually, I, look, no offense to anybody, I don't think Case State had a real player score a touchdown in this game. Now that I look at it, the touchdowns came from Winston Dimmel, Morgan Burns, Glenn Gronkowski, Joe Hubner, and that's it. So, yeah, a real player did not score a touchdown <laughs> in this game for Case State. Cody Cook threw an interception. So, shout out to the yeah. Cody Cook truthers out there. The fact that Cody Cook threw an interception in this game. And three fullback score or three fullback touchdowns. Awesome. Uh, another odd one. Apparently, Zach Davidson had a pass in this game. I no no recollection of that. No. Uh, your boy Justin Silman six carries, eighteen yards. K State used. Let's see, one, two. They used three different running backs in the game. Dalvin Warmack got himself a, a little carry there. I'm pretty sure at one point in time. Uh, my wife's uh, cousin dated Dalvin Warmack for a stretch. Oh. Obviously, did not work out. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's ba- that's basically it. this. I mean, that game it was a ho hum, forty five to fourteen butt kicking of KU. So there you have it. There you have it. I I look. I thought it was going to be more fun. <laughs> there was a little less steam to it than I thought at uh, at various points. Um, just because, man. It, you really look at it, KU does a lot to beat themselves in these games. And that's the one thing that I think with Lance Leipold we thought would change. And last year, it didn't because KU forced that initial punt from K-State and just a beauty by Ty Zentner. And it was also slick. So KU muffs the punt and K-State immediately gets it down in KU territory and scores and capitalizes. And the game was really never going to be the same after that point. Uh I think that's a little bit different now, but if Jason Bean plays, that that's you know it's not out of the realm of possibility that he makes some boneheaded moves because that's kind of what he has done at quarterback for KU. He's awesome for three and a half quarters, and then you know you give him those last ten minutes of a game when you need him to come through or just to not make a massive error, and he makes a massive error. So uh, that's the one thing that has really shown through in KU games of the past, where the Jayhawks have done themselves no favors in making K-State actually go out and work hard to get that victory. Yeah, uh, I mean, you bring up the weather. Shout out to the weather this weekend. We're getting a much better day than we got last year for the KU K-State game. It was so cold and so wet. Yes, no, it is going to be uh, a much better uh, situation for the weather this weekend, although I've, we've had a bad time talking weather on this show this year. Uh, <laughs> It, you say one thing and then it immediately changes, but it's looking like Saturday, uh, mid sixties through the day. So we'll probably be in, in the fifties by kickoff, but not too bad. It'll be, uh, excuse me, be a good time. I will say, I, I think we're actually in a good weather spot, like moving forward for the rest of the year where we might avoid any wet weather that takes place. Well, you just jinx it for next week. Yeah, that's all right. Farmageddon probably deserves a little bit of a, a, a wet weather, cold situation. A lot of those Iowa State games see, seem cold. So the 2015 cold. Iowa State game was freezing. I just It was like cutting through every layer of your body. Uh, very cold. But All right, well, that will do it for us. Appreciate those that stuck all the way to the end to hear us just ran on about random K-State box scores. Uh, K-State 31-10 in 2013. Over KU. You want take a guess real quick on the way out. How many times did John Hubert carry the football in that game? In 13? Yeah. Like, I'll say 28. Mm, very close. He carried it 30 times for 220 yards. So oh, shout out to my man Robert Rose. Three carries, four yards. There you go. 
Uh, K-State only, you know, K-State, uh, they're still going to run a little bit in that game. Uh, also had a tight end score a touchdown in 2013. Any was guesses this, on who? Was this another one that stuck around for a while? Uh, possibly. Oh. Mm. Yeah, I don't have a guess on this Zach one. Trujillo. Oh, he did stick around for a while. Uh, Glenn Gronkowski had a 29-yard touchdown reception in the game. So Glenn Gronkowski and Winston Dimmel, both KU killers in yeah. those games. And oh, four interceptions by the Cats in the game. Shout out to Dylan Schellenberg with a pick <laughs> against the Jayhawks. That is a, that's an all-time moment for, for K-State football right there. So shout out to Dylan Schellenberg and the 2013 Cats uh, for – being what that would have been like w- the fifth win in this stretch that we're currently on. Yeah. So, yeah, that, yeah. That was one five. Yep. So yeah. 10 year anniversary of K state's 2013 win over KU and Dylan <laughs> Schellenberg's pick. Uh, <laughs> never forget for drew Galloway. I'm Mason Vo. Stay locked in with KSO as we head all the way up to the weekend in the sunflower showdown. And also K state's MTE basketball event as they are in the Bahamas. They face Providence Friday night at five o'clock and then Sunday, They will get either Georgia or Miami. So that will do it. Thanks for watching and listening to K-State Online.